Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Elise Mayer, the Director of Marketing at Smashfly, and I'm going to be your happy host for our webinar. Um, happy Thursday, and thanks for joining us on Smashfly's final webinar of 2018, the coolest recruitment marketing campaigns and how to build them in 2019. So the audio for today's discussion is going to be through your computer speakers or headphones, so please make sure your volume is up. Um, if you have any issues, please just pop them right into the uh, Q&A box and I'll try to address them. Also, if you have any other questions for the speakers, also just continue to, to type those right into the Q&A box in the lower left hand of your corner and I'll flag those for Q&A with the speakers at um, the end of the webinar. We'll try to leave about 10 minutes for that at the end. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please call ReadyTalk Support. I'll be typing in a number for that as well in the chat window for reference. Um, and of course, the number one question, today's session will be recorded. Um, we'll be sending you links to the recording and the slides via email. Those slides will actually um, include the uh, little demo videos of the email editor walkthrough too. And one quick note, by attending this webinar, um, you're eligible to receive a SHRM Professional Development Credit. So please look out for the email for that with the code um, if you're going to use that. And now to get started, we've got some double VP power on today's call. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to both of my amazing <laughs> colleagues, uh, Josh and Tracy, uh, your expert speakers for an introduction. So Tracy, you're up. Hey, thanks so much, Elise. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Happy December. Capping off the year, I'm glad to be here. I'm Tracy Parsons. I'm Smashfly's Recruitment Marketing uh, Center of Excellence Vice President. And uh, this is the sort of stuff that wakes me up every morning. And I'm excited to share with a lot of this stuff with you guys today. And uh, I'm excited to be joined by Josh as well. So Josh, take it away. Thanks, Tracy. And uh, don't let the uh, VP titles fool you. It doesn't mean we're uh, any more important than anybody else on the call here. Um, but I'm Josh Blaine. Excuse me, VP of Marketing at Smashfly. I've uh, been with Smashfly for about two years, um, mostly marketing background for me, although we are hiring for my team right now. So I am I'm getting the full recruiting lifecycle experience as a sourcer, recruiter, hiring manager, onboarder, trainer, everything. So um, I think that helps me bring some perspective, and I'm excited to share kind of my own history with, with uh, email campaigns and marketing generally. All right, I think we can... I think I got control now. We'll move on. So let's get started. Kind of, um, I don't. I think there's probably a varying degree or varying level of experience with campaigns uh, for the folks on the call. Maybe some of you have actually run email campaigns before. Maybe some of you have never done it. And you're trying to figure out what the heck a campaign is and, and what it means, um, especially in, in the talent acquisition kind of HR space. So what we want to do to start is kind of level set on what a campaign is. And when we think about recruitment marketing campaigns and, and employer branding campaigns. What does that really mean, and how do we map out what a campaign looks like? At, like, at a high level, I think there's four, four components or four elements to an effective campaign. Um, there's really the marketing element, which is, is to kind of generate reach and awareness, um, kind of influence the market, make, pe make people aware of who you are. The second piece is interest. So once they're aware of who you are, how do they, how do they become interested in what you're doing or what you can offer? Um, there's an element of trust there that, that can be developed through an effective campaign. The third is connection. So again, interaction with your leads and your target audience once they're interested in who you are and what you do. How do you continue to kind of build a relationship with those folks and, and connect with them on a little bit of a deeper level? And then there's conversion. So what are you, what are you measuring against? What, what matters to you? Um, in some contexts, that might be an application. Um, in others, it might honestly just be as simple as them joining your talent network or um, continuing to, to engage or interact with your content. But that conversion piece, whatever that action is that you really want them to do, is pretty critical to measuring the success of the campaign. And what I think is really cool about this, Josh, is that that's from you know looking at this from a you know traditional B two C marketing lens. And when I look at this as a recruitment marketer, it's the same stuff, right? It's just that our audience is right. different. We really need to help people understand what makes our employer brand cool. So we want to generate uh, awareness to the job seeking audience, and whether they're passive or active. Um, we want to get them interested in them and educate them about what it means to work there to start building relationships and trust with us. And then ultimately, in just like marketing, only a little bit different, right? So we don't have a, a 
huge inventory of things, we have a few select jobs. So I think it's I think it's really just what we're trying to do in recruitment marketing, exactly what they're doing in marketing, just with a lens of our audience is a little bit different. And instead of, you know, selling somebody some toothpaste, we're trying to sell them a life. <laughs> right. And I think that's that's key too, right? All of us have been have been um have experienced a campaign in one way or another, right? We we're all consumers of something. Uh, we've all been marketed to. We all get you know bombarded with emails every single day, and we'll talk a little bit about that, Tracy. But none of this stuff, I think, is anything that that should be relatively new to anybody. It's just applying it in a different way and, and really understanding you know the product that we're selling. Um, sometimes that is a job. Sometimes it's just the idea of an opportunity. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's get into what a campaign really is. Um, I think sometimes marketers, and I'm, this isn't just recruitment marketers or, or TA folks, I, I think even marketers look at campaigns as one-off um, email sends sometimes. So they'll look at it and say, you know, all right, I'm going to run an email campaign, and, and that's it. Like, I'm going to send one email. I'm going to hope that somebody clicks on that email and buys my thing or, or engages with my brand, and that's the end of it. But in reality, an effective campaign, an effective marketing campaign of any kind, whether we're selling a product or we're selling a career, um, it should be omnichannel. And, and what do we mean by omnichannel? Um, that really just means that it's, um, it, it, it kind of spans the different channels or kind of experiences that, that your candidates and, and the people that you're marketing to will, will be active in. That could be social, it could be SMS, um, it could be offline, it could be direct mail type stuff. Um, but there are, there are multiple channels that candidates uh, and people today generally are engaging with, um, and it's kind of understanding those different channels and, and the message that needs to be sent across them. The second here is high touch. So what do we mean by that? Again, it's, um, it's kind of being present, um, having a cadence to, um, to the messaging that you're sending, to the campaigns that you're building. Um, so, so again, you know, what, what are you trying to say? When are you trying to say it? And, and how does that, that experience kind of progress over time? Third is action driven. So again, going back to that previous slide, what is it that you ultimately want the person to do? Um, in consumer marketing, again, it's, it's oftentimes to sign up for a newsletter or buy a product. In recruiting, it's obviously a little bit different, but there's some sort of outcome or some sort of action that we want uh, the person to take, and, and it's critical to think through that. Tracy, I don't know if you have any thoughts there. Yeah, I do, and I really think that I, what I love about this is these, this, these are the things that we all need to remember, right? And just to reiterate what you're saying, Josh, a, a campaign is not just a one-off. It's not just this one-off thing that I send out a, a communication and that makes a campaign. Um, you know, we've got, we've got the ability to reach them in a lot of different ways. We've got to make sure that it feels personal. And, again, I cannot stress enough how important it is that whenever you are sending a series of, of communications that there is a direct call to action that people need to know what you're supposed to do with a communication. Right. And I think the thing, too, that people get hung up on sometimes is going back to the second point around high touch. It, that can be really difficult to do at scale. Um, I think automation is great at, at being able to send mass email campaigns. So you can send, um, you know, a million emails to a million different people, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean high touch, right? There's, there's some uh, degree of personalization and relevancy that comes with that high touch, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So talking about omnichannel, kind of that first point from the previous slide, you know, why does omnichannel matter? Why does it matter that you kind of exist outside of just email or just SMS? Um, well, if we look at these stats here, we know that 98% of Americans switch between devices in the same day. And what that tells us, again, is um, you have people who are bouncing between these different experiences. They're on a mobile browser, um, and that mobile browser, that mobile email application is going to be a little bit different. Um, we also know that uh, I think it's 98% of text messages get opened versus email. So, again, considering the channel that you're delivering to, um, what is the experience that someone typically has there, and how do you need to kind of shape your message for that? The second point here, 90% of consumers expect consistent interactions across channels. Um, again, this doesn't mean that it has to be the exact same experience, but it means that the message has to kind of build on itself. So um, as you're developing an email campaign, you need to think through what that looks like on social as well. Um, how is it going to supplement or kind of augment the message that you sent via email? The third point here is 75% of employees say their company doesn't promote their brand on employer brand on social. I think this is this is one that's 
I know Tracy, you're going to hit on a little bit that's just a little bit crazy to me in, in a world where social is so important. Um, and it's such a natural way to really promote and talk about your brand and showcase um, what your company stands for and, and share these employee stories that I think a lot of companies are investing in, yet there's really just no activity here at all. Yeah, and I think that's one of the big challenges that I see, you know, continually going on in the industry. And I realized not too long ago that I ran my first social campaign in 19, or I'm sorry, in 2005 on MySpace. And it's still amazing to me that we're using this uh, this new channel around connection and communication and and interaction and engagement to just broadcast jobs, which I think is a big miss. Uh, for our space. So I think when, you know, when we talk about omnichannel, it does have to be social. It has to be mobile. It has to be website. It has to be you know, any kind of interaction that you're going to create that where your audience is hanging out. You want to be there, and you want to be telling a consistent story. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So and now we, we've talked about omnichannel. Let's talk about high touch too, right? So um, a few more stats to consider. And I know I see some questions in the um, – coming through the chat here. We'll, we'll share the uh, sources for the data here afterward, um, unless uh, Lise or somebody else gets to it first. But um, three and a half billion search queries performed on Google every single day. There are 350,000 tweets that are sent every single minute. And then the average number of emails a uh, person gets every single day is right around 90. And I can say that my email inbox, my personal email inbox, is probably a little bit more than that. Um, I, I read a stat recently, and I don't know it off the top of my head, but the number um, uh, or the amount of time that someone spends cleaning up their email, email inbox, just deleting emails, um, is it, something close to an hour every single day, which is just, wow. it blows me away. Uh, it blows me away. But I, I think it just speaks to the fact that there's a lot of noise out there. Um, and this isn't just with products. It's not just with jobs or employers. It's everything. Um, we're bombarded with messaging uh, across multiple channels, Every single day, we've got travel sites that we look on, friends, family, and family influencers, celebrities. There's just this crazy amount of digital exhaust that's out there. Um, so standing out becomes really difficult, right? But when it's high touch, there, I think we all probably have a brand or two, um, again, in, in the consumer world or in the employer brand world. Um, I know there are a few that we'll talk about a little bit later that I always save their emails. I won't always read them right away, mm -hmm. but when I'm going through the process of just, you know, doing that immediate scrub and deleting emails, there's a couple that I'll just immediately recognize and know I'm going to save, and I'll go back and open them later. And the reason is they've given me a reason over time uh, to pay attention to what they have to say. Um, so, I, you know, there's, we'll kind of get, get to what that means and how you do that a little bit later and some examples of, um, you know, what these campaigns kind of feel like. But, but there is a way to stand out. It's not impossible in today's world. No, it's it's really not, and I think the, I think that ability to feel personal, and I always I always tell people like if if you get a hundred emails a day, and I I did do the math on this once uh, last year, and I do get over a hundred, and right around a hundred, and I keep three, and the three that I keep are generally consistent, falling in a couple different categories. One, it's somebody I know, and I like to make you know continue my relationships. The other one is something I need to do, which speaks to having a great call to action. And the third one is something that's valuable to me. And when, when there is a brand that consistently sends me things that are valuable, I always remember that to Josh's point. So, for example, I might get a lot of emails from a specific retailer that tells me that they have a sale. Um, but when I get emails from this other retailer, they're giving me style tips. And those style tips ch stay right. in my inbox. So when I am interested in purchasing some new clothes, I'm going to the company that's helping me look cooler than the company that's yeah. offering me a sale. Totally agree. I think there's so many And we can, so do, and we can do that in recruitment as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's like, it, go, it kind of reminds me of, um, of Patagonia is one that I always pay attention to. But with Patagonia, mm -hmm. it's less about the products they're selling, and it's much more about this mission that they have, right? And, it's, and you know, they create content and uh, videos, and, and all that stuff is kind of the, the showpiece in their, in their content or in their campaigns. And to me, it's, it just always adds some sort of value. It gives me some reason to pay attention more than, you know, I need to buy a vest or a jacket or whatever else. There's just some, there's, there's more meaning yep. and more kind of purpose, purpose behind it. Yep. All right, and the last thing here, so we talked about omnichannel and high-touch action-driven. So, again, what does, that, what does that mean? I love this, uh, this meme here, but um, it's really just about delivering some sort of strong call to action. And, and, again, it's not necessarily a strong call to action 
for you, it's, it's a strong call to action that's relevant to the, the audience that you're targeting. So um, don't assume that everybody wants to apply or that everybody's going to apply. Um, the reality, um, I think we know from LinkedIn data, is that only 12% of, um, of the candidate market is actively looking for a job. So that means the vast majority of people that you're going to be campaigning to aren't going to apply to your job or aren't interested in your jobs right now. So you've got to think through what that call to action is or at least provide multiple calls to action that, that are relevant. So again, that gets to the second point here, um, including a relevant and personalized message. So personalization can take a lot of forms. Uh, I know personalization can feel overwhelming to where you think um, you've got to, to really truly craft an individual email for an individual person, and that's really not the case. Um, we'll get into what it looks like to segment uh, a database and, and really segment a campaign a little bit later, but you can kind of group people by certain attributes and certain behaviors that, that tell you uh, or, or suggest that they might care about the same things. And when you do that, then you can create, you can still kind of create mass campaigns, um, but those mass campaigns are going to feel a little bit more personal. And the last one here is lead to a memorable or at least simple experience. So again, don't try and say everything um, to everybody in, in a single campaign or a single message. Really focus um, your, your call to action and your message on um, where, whatever uh, or wherever you are in the cadence of a campaign. So if you're just getting started, um, someone doesn't know anything about your brand, you're just trying to get them to raise their hand or, or engage with you, that message can be super simple. Just focus on getting to the next step in that journey as opposed to um, asking somebody to marry you on, on the first date, to use that old analogy. <laughs> All right, Absolutely. so we're, uh, I'm going to pass it. Yeah, I'm going to pass it off to the real expert at this point. But Tracy, I know you've worked a lot <laughs> with um, with actual practitioners and, and companies on their employer brand strategy and, and recruitment marketing strategy. But Sound Physicians is one that that I know has always stood out. Right, and I'm always I'm always grateful when we have you know real pack, real words from real practitioners. And you have to think about it this way, you guys. A person really won't keep coming back to the same thing over and over again um, if that respect and interest isn't returned, right? So think about your top talent. They're probably, you know, not likely to bite on a laundry list of recs or cold outreach without seeing the bigger so what, right? You have to, you have to tell them why this matters to them. You have to tell them what's in it for them. You know, your campaigns always should be audience-driven, not you-driven, right? So think about the emails that you keep. Think about the texts that you keep. Think about the social posts that you interact with. There's really something in it for you. And you can't let this be a one and done, right? So this is one of the reasons that campaigns and nurturing is so very critical in the candidate experience. You can't give one person one chance when there are, you know, their career is going to span 40 years. So it's just really something to think about. And this is just words of wisdom from, from Rosie and what she teaches her team. Yeah, and just quickly on, on so, that too, Tracy, I love, yeah, I love that. You know, I love that last point there on that quote, um, but it's about that sequence of touch points, right? I think that kind of builds on what we were talking about before and, and, and brings some concreteness to, to what we're recommending here. But it really is thinking through that journey um, and that life cycle for, for someone and saying at this particular stage, if they exhibit this kind of behavior or, or we have this amount of data on them, um, this is the message we're going to send, and this is the call to action we're going to we're going to ask for. And, and it's just taking like incremental steps toward that ultimate conversion, but not necessarily gearing everything toward that ultimate conversion right away. Absolutely, and it does feel like I know the practitioners that are sitting out there with us today. I know that you guys are thinking about, oh my God, how do I ever do this, and how do I get this done, and how do I boil the ocean, and it feels a little bit of like ocean boiling, but I will tell you that we're going to dive into some best of the best, and you'll see how it can be done, and I, I want you guys to think about this as baby steps, right? It's that we, we've got we've to start somewhere, and this is kind of hopefully going to give you some inspiration around the, ex, the experience that other brands are creating with their campaigning, and, and quite frankly, you know, the world really is our oyster, and unfortunately, the oyster just isn't all that job focused and it doesn't get the same results um, when you focus when you focus on the job than if you focus on the brand focusing on the brand delivers results so if I were to in my three years of smash fly and in my 20 years of doing this I would say this is the number one question 
that I am constantly asked, what, what do I send them? What do, what do I send them? What do they need to know? And, and quite honestly, it, it blows my mind because you don't even realize how much content you're just sitting on right now. And if you think about it, your campaigns can be a lot of different things. So you could run a campaign that is specific to engineering or front of house restaurant staff or education. There, there are absolutely a number of campaigns that you can run around job families. Excuse me, I had to cough. Uh, the, there's another, you know, you could do a whole bunch of campaigning around your employer brand. You could do a series of employee stories and the impact that your employers, employees are making on your brand. You might be hiring military, diversity, uh, campus. There could be an entire campaign series dedicated to different audience segments. Josh, what do you think about those those key three things that we were just talking about? Like these are this is low hanging fruit. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we so Elise, who started the call off, uh, and myself every year, we we do this research report, the Fortune 500 benchmarks report. Um, and I think the thing that always blows us away every single year is that there's clearly effort being put into um, employer branding uh, and creating content. Right? There's a ton of companies that are building uh, employee stories, whether they're written or video. And those, that content, um, it, a lot of times it just stops dead um, on the career site. It's published to the career site. Maybe it's published to a company blog, a career blog. But that is, that is ripe for an email campaign um, or some sort of social Absolutely. campaign. Absolutely. Um, so so it's, it's not necessarily about having to like recreate things or um, you know, duplicate efforts. A, a lot of times the, the content already exists. So the raw materials there, is just, it's just the, the mechanics of kind of building out the campaign. And even the, today's event, right? You probably got a series of, it, of emails and communications around this specific event. So if you're hosting a campus event, you've got to start, you know, getting people up, uh, understanding what that is in terms of when the event is, where it's located, getting them invited, getting them signed up, reminding them the event. It could be an entire campaign around events that you're hosting. Um, there's also the opportunity. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but you know, most of the employers that I'm working with have thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that have either opted in through a talent network or have applied in the past that we're not re-engaging. So there could be an entire campaign series around re-engaging people, helping them build out their profiles so that we know a little bit more about their passions and where they might fit in in our company. And there's a yeah. tremendous and amount of automation that could happen. I was just going to say the same thing, Tracy. I think that's where people wonder where automation fits into this and how they can – kind of remove the burden from their teams. Because we all know that recruiting teams and talent acquisition teams generally are pretty strapped for resources. Um, a lot of times they're not growing their teams necessarily. In fact, sometimes the organization is looking at how they can save money and save headcount in, in HR and TA. So um, that, that, this is where automation is, is really a no-brainer. Um, so an example uh, for the re-engagement and profile building, for example, would be um, you know, if after six months you've got a segment in your database that has been completely inactive. Um, maybe you trigger a campaign to them where it's just trying to bring them back into the fold, trying to get them interested in, in kind of um, engaging with the brand or giving you updated information on, on where they are in their career. So that's something that you can set up once and have deployed um, on a regular basis without your recruiter, recruiters or, or employer brand team having to, to really touch the technology. Yeah, and the, the last one that we'll cover a little bit today are uh, ongoing newsletter series, you know, updating the updating candidates on what's going on at your business, updating them on what's interesting um, that you guys might have in common with your audience, and then obviously we'll we'll feed some jobs there. But there are there are a number of different campaign options that you could really take advantage of, and we're going to dive into a couple examples next. Any f parting thoughts on these ideas, JP? No, I think you nailed it. Awesome. So I don't know if you guys are familiar, GE last year uh, did a fantastic campaign. Um, GE had a goal that they really wanted to employ 20,000 women in tech and meet a 50-50 hiring ratio for women in STEM uh, by the year 2020. So they launched this campaign. It had a great hashtag called Balance the Equation, and the, the star was you know, a STEM celebrity, Millie Dresselhaus. 
they did quite literally everything. There were TV spots, there were landing pages, there were email campaigns, there were social media campaigns. And what was really fascinating about this is that, yeah, they had some budget around TV, but it also got a lot of um, a lot of traction in the industry beyond TV. They had, you know, the, the hashtag was incredibly successful, and the 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 campaign ended up generating 500 targeted leads for the brand. Amazing. And I think, too, um, again, talking about the, the omni-channel, right? Like omni-channel is a buzzword, and I think there can be some confusion around it. But what's very clear here is they've got the landing page set up. Um, there's a very targeted message there. They've got a YouTube video that if, if you're searching on YouTube um, or just kind of out on, on the web, you're going to discover that. Um, you've got a Twitter post here that, um, again, is feeding off of this and feeding back into the campaign. Um, so again, multiple, multiple channels, multiple devices, but a very consistent, really relevant message to the campaign that's being run. Yeah, and it was really interesting when they, when they sent out one of the first email communications after 48 hours, they had a 76% open rate, a 10% click-through rate, and a 2% apply rate. So industry average on emails are about 22% open rate, and GE scored a 26% open rate. 2% click-through rate is average. They got 10%, um, and their apply rate was 2%. So when you look at how this compared, again, when you have the target, you have the message, you have the stories, that it's omni-channel, it gets the results you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about Staples. Um, Staples does a lot of different things. So you'll see this is, I think this is a uh, email communication. And again, we're showing a lot of email communication because it's kind of difficult to pull other examples. Um, but the idea was to get them to stay top of mind to their talent. And what they wanted to do, do and communicate was that we're constantly investing in our talent. And it's about creating a positive long-term experience, right? So it's, it's not about a laundry list of random jobs. It's, it's really targeted to the experience that you're going to have working, with, working at Staples. And if you get, you know, if you keep interacting with this content, yeah, you get to jobs. But the idea was we have to sell them on really content that's going to be valuable to them to allow them to stay engaged with this, with this brand. So it's not just about apply now, apply now, apply now. It's about let us educate you about what it means to work at Staples so that we can convert you when the timing is right. When you're ready and we're ready, it's a, it's a shorter sell. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I think it's, it's just one of those things that I think, you know, it seems very simple on the surface. I think the, the inclination or the tendency, and I'm speaking as a marketer whose job is to help sell tough technology, right? I have goals that are tied to our sales team, and, and I feel that pressure every single day. But sometimes it's just better to step back and really put yourself in the shoes of the buyer. Um, so we're, you know, we sell to the people who are on the phone right now, and I would love to sell you Smashfly, but you might not be ready to buy Smashfly. You might not know anything about us. You might not have budget for it. Um, it just might not be the right time. So, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that the, re the relationship doesn't have to exist or that it has to end at that point. Um, I think there's a lot of value that can still be, be given or kind of added to our audience, even if they're not ready to buy Smashfly. This is what Staples, I think, does really well, is, is they're really thinking about it from their candidate's perspective. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is this specific uh, person in this specific job family or job category care about? What is it they need in their life? What could they use help with? Um, and, and kind of that, that approach around utility and being really useful, um, it, it pays off. It might not pay off in, ter in terms of short-term um, conversion, conversions and applicants and, and that kind of stuff. I think um, looking at it that way is probably the wrong way to measure it. Um, but if you look at the long tail and you really evaluate someone's relationship with you over time, um, especially if it's a, it's a really difficult role to fill, um, there's just there's there's very tangible value there that I think um, there there are different kind of metrics you have to use to assess that. But it's it's one of those things that I, I can tell you from experience running multiple campaigns, the people who are very hard to sell, um, that that approach or that mentality really does pay off. You bet. So a lot of people are um, wondering oh, and always asking me, like, well, what do we do with when we win an award? And I always point back to this Cheesecake Factory um, campaign. They won a best place, Fortune 100 best place to work, right? So best companies to work. 
And this is a really targeted, so when we talk about making it personal and making it direct and making sure that it feels that way, um, Cheesecake won five consecutive awards in a row. And what they did was they segmented their audience into front of house and kitchen. And they looked at people who had not engaged with the brand in the last six months. And so some of these contacts hadn't heard from Cheesecake in a couple of years. So the campaign that was designed, it was really designed to not only uh, announce this great award, but to start getting them reengaged. Uh, we, we used some automation to identify contacts who had clicked into the campaign to understand who was engaged so that we can understand how, they, what they, how they're behaving with the campaign so that we could get even more powerful communications out there. And, you know, when it comes to differentiating your brand, it's important to talk about what it is that you do really well. And in a lot of these instances, I don't know if there's a lot of people on the, on the phone that have um, retail restaurant needs, but this is a very hard to fill. Kitchen staff is incredibly difficult to fill. And so when you have these big marketing and PR wins, it is a great opportunity to get this out in email and text. We did a tremendous text campaign um, with, with uh, Cheesecake Factory as well to support this. And what ended up happening is they generated 510 applications from this campaign alone. That's incredible. It really is. And you think about what most yeah. companies are willing to pay pay for an applicant, right, through job distribution and Indeed and whatever else. There there are cost per applicant models that you can you can make a quantifiable quantifiable ROI um, argument here. Um, and again, the the amount of effort that went into building this campaign um, is re relatively minimal um, when you consider the cost savings. Exactly. And and next up is uh, CVS. CVS, when we talk about military, CVS does a ton um, to support their military. They, they've got a tremendous military initiative. In fact, their team that supports the military initiative is wonderful. Um, and it is a core value of who they are. So it's really important that, they've got, that they're driving um, candidates directly to landing pages, communicating to them. They're getting some information on their talent network to make sure that they're drafting campaigns and communications that are targeted to military professionals, and then telling that military story of the impact that that person had at CVS Health. So you can, you can again, whether it's diversity or military or campus, it's important to craft campaigns that are really valuable to the audience you're trying to attract. Yeah, I think, so we just had a question come in here from, looks like Sarah. Um, and I think this is actually a good time to address it, Tracy, but um, she's asking how, um, when we're sending these campaigns to a list, how do you generate or add potential applicants to your list? So there's probably a two-prong two way to answer this. Um, the way you can do it is, um, so just I'll speak to Smashfly, but I think a lot of CRMs probably function this way as well. You can, you can take your, um, your, your previous applicants, so silver medalists or people who have just applied previously, and you can create a segment around that in the CRM. Um, and then when you're building out your campaign, which we'll show you how to do later, um, you just select that list. So if you, want to, if you want to campaign to previous applicants and get them to apply again, um, and you want to focus just on silver medalists um, to kind of keep things focused on quality, because I, I saw a question in, in the chat here too about quality. How do you ensure that it, you know, it's great to have a volume of applicants, but how do you know those applicants are actually good ones? This is again where I think you know campaigns give you a, a good measure of control, um, as opposed to just you know shotgun blasting out on job boards and waiting for for names to flood in. Um, the beauty of, of starting from your database and really um, you know kind of targeting who you're campaigning to, you have some control over that quality. Um, you help kind of define what that means. So you know with CVS here, for example, they have this landing page set up for their military program. They've got a, a form and an opt-in. Um, and when, you, when, when a candidate fills out that form, they're automatically added to a list um, in, in the CRM. Now why that's important is, again, um, you can decide when you're building out your, your campaign or you're setting up automated workflows that it only goes to people on that list. And then even further, you can filter it and say, I only want a specific um, section of this list to get this campaign um, who have certain qualifications. So again, it's, you're almost kind of screening there and ensuring that any sort of um, quantity that comes through that campaign is, is theoretically going to be high quality. So a little bit of a, like I got off track here, but I thought that was kind of important. Yeah, and I, I just want to add one, one point to that is that if you want to focus on quality, it's really important that your content tells the audience 
what's meaningful for you. So give them an opportunity to screen themselves in or out based on the content, and it's okay if they screen themselves out. If, you know, if you're the kind of organization that doesn't have a tremendous amount of work-life balance, that's okay. Tell them now. It's cheaper to tell them now and get them out before they get into the ATS than when they come work and then leave because it's really costly to retain people or really costly to uh, re-recruit people. Um, here's one of my favorite customers and, and newsletters when it comes around to Southern California Edison, and I, I absolutely love the consistency. They do a tremendous oper- they do a tremendous amount of campaigning on a monthly basis to their talent network. They segment their talent network into different professions, and then they put comfort uh, they put content out that's going to be really meaningful for that audience. And it's really interesting because they're consistent. It's a very you can expect a newsletter every single month from Southern California Edison. And, you know, it's great, but it does take a little thought. It does take a little news, but there's, that's where putting together a content calendar is really going to help you guys when it comes to doing these uh, monthly newsletters. And then from an automation standpoint, um, I absolutely love what Intel does. So they have, they have if you join Intel's Talent Network, they send you a communication every month for three months consistently. And it basically continues to educate you on what it means to work there and what you get out of it and the impact that you can create. And it's really about, again, educating that audience because a lot of big brands don't have an awareness problem. They have an education problem. They need to help people understand what it means to impact at Intel. Um, so these drip communications that just run behind the scenes, it takes no extra work from the brand press to set up. Everybody in the talent network gets a, a, a communication that's going to be valuable to them to help them see or not see that Intel is a great place for them. And our friends at Purina, um, they also have an amazing um, series of campaigns. They do targeted pipeline emails, so helping people see what the job is, right? They do some diversity inclusion campaigns, and they also do employer brand and employee stories campaigns. What's interesting is this is kind of a showcase of all the pieces, of a couple of the pieces, um, and again, it's not all email, um, but it's really omni-channel, it's really high touch, and it's really, you know, action driven. And this is a part of their larger 2018 strategy that has driven 6,000 applicants. And whoever asked about quality a second ago, their strategy has developed a, a result that 67 plus percent of the people who have applied from these campaigns meet basic qualifications. And a fifth of those made it all the way through our phone screen process. So the, it is quality. If you're, spending the, if you're spending the effort and the calories to create content that's going to get people to screen themselves in and out, that's what's going to make a difference. And interestingly enough, their campaigning has netted them 54 hires this year. So if you take into consideration that the data shows the average hire can cost uh, the business upwards of $5,000 per hire, when you do a creative and engaging campaign strategy to the leads that you're already paying to generate, you can drive a tremendous ROI for the business because they're people you've already paid to attract. Yeah, I think just quickly, Tracy, I'll, I know we're going to move here because we want to make sure we have time for <laughs> a lot of good questions. But um, just from my own perspective, so again, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I'm hiring right now for our team. Um, I'm sure Elise is probably chuckling on the other end of this because we've, we've had, a, had to play dual roles here of marketer slash recruiter. Um, but we, and I think this speaks to, you know, what Smashlight does pretty well from a recruitment marketing and brand building uh, perspective. But we really didn't do any sort of advertising um, at all for this open uh, opportunity that we have. We ended up getting, I think, right around 50 applications, which, you know, might not sound like a lot, but considering we did absolutely no marketing, uh, or I should say no advertising at all, and, and our marketing kind of brand building had, had you know, spoken for itself, um, we ended up with uh, five really solid candidates in about a week without us really having to do any sort of proactive um, or kind of reactive uh, work getting those people in. So. This stuff works. It, it absolutely works, um, even for a company as small as us. Um, I know there was a question in the chat here about, you know, it's great that GE can do this stuff. GE's got a ton of money and a bigger team. Um, but I can tell you from, from our team, 
Um, we, we don't really have a recruitment marketing team or a talent acquisition team at our company. Um, it's Tracy and our head of HR. And then, you know, the people who are actually hiring are, are full-blown, uh, full life cycle recruiters slash hiring managers. So um, I, I can tell you from my own experience right now in the moment that this stuff really does deliver. And so you'll notice that it's, he's right, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A section. But one of the things that I think is interesting is you'll notice that there's not a lot of play on, this, on these communications that relate to jobs. So, yes, jobs are important, but they're not the end-all, be-all, right? They can, be at the, they can be at the bottom. You've got to earn that right to ask for something. You're giving before you get and, you know, take a look at the difference between this email, and we've done some nice glamour do's and don'ts barring out, the, barring out the brand. But you'll see this coming from a random ATS. And if you look at, you know, I'm interested in a digital marketing manager job, and I'm being served with a list that says firmware engineer and circuit design engineer and um, strategic category analyst, these are not meeting my needs, if you think about it from the audience's standpoint. So it's going to be really easy for me to just simply delete this. Um, and frankly, I might not open that communication again. And in fact, I might even opt out. Yeah, totally agree. Yep. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Josh, to walk through the how to build these great things. And you're up. Cool. Okay. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I think there are a few questions that have come in here. It looks like Amanda asked, how do you strategize, prioritize that piece as part of a recruiter's job? I think that's an excellent question and probably a, a big fear for a lot of people. Um, and we hear it from our, our customers all the time. It's, it's not that they don't believe that this is important. It's not that they don't buy into the concept or the idea. It's, I don't think I have time for this. Um, and, and I totally empathize with that. I can tell you it's, it's um, you know, especially when you're getting started, it can be a little bit difficult. But the beauty of this and the beauty of kind of automation once, once you, you get used to using it is that a lot of this stuff is, is you set it up, you put the initial effort into to getting it going, and then the automation and, and the drip campaign take care of themselves from there. Um, now there's some, some you know, monitoring and updating of creative that you have to do, but a lot of this stuff is um, a heavy lift in the beginning and then a very little, um, very little effort from there, especially on your recruiters and, and your folks that have day jobs and other things to worry about. But I think what I want to show you now is um, actually what it, it looks like to build a campaign um, and how simple it can be. So again, we'll, just to kind of refresh and level set the elements of a killer email campaign. And again, we're focusing on email because it's the easiest, th easiest thing to show visually. Um, just keep in mind that any of this stuff can really be applied to um, social, SMS, um, you know, any other channel that you're kind of targeting. But the elements, of, in our mind at least, of a killer email campaign are purpose, uh, purpose and specific action. So again, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to communicate? And what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to help the candidate with something specific? Are you providing career tips? Are you, are you telling them employee stories that you can kind of sell them on, on why you're a great place to work? What's the message and structure? So subject lines are, are critical. Um, probably one of the most important elements of an email campaign is, is that subject line. Um, that's your hook, that's your, your, your best opportunity to get somebody to open it up. Um, segmentation, which again, we've talked a lot about on this, on this webinar so far, but you know, who, who are you really messaging to? Um, if, if you're, uh, the old quote that I kind of use all the time is that if you're marketing to everybody, you're marketing to nobody. Um, you're much better off sending uh, a really targeted email to a list of 100 people than sending a really generic email to a list of 10,000 people. Your conversion is going to be much stronger when, when the relevancy is there. Timing and cadence is critical. So again, um, what time of day do you send the email? Um, which day of the week do you send the email? Um, I, I think in this case here, um, it comes down to who you're communicating with. So again, if, you, if it's um, job related and you're trying to get somebody to convert, they're more than likely not going to fill out an application at their day job. So you know, emailing them on a Tuesday at, at 10 a.m. You know, might not be the best idea. But emailing them at 8 p.m. on a Wednesday when they're you know, sitting on a couch and you know, maybe scrolling through Indeed or, or opening their email and might take an hour to apply um, obviously makes a lot more sense. Then the cadence is, again, what, um, what's the flow of the communications, the journey that you want to take somebody on? Um, emailing them every single day for a week straight is, a, is probably a quick way to get somebody to, to tune you out. But if you, if you kind of add value and trickle value out over time and, and kind of lead them down a path, um, Tracy mentioned Intel, but Intel does a great, great job of this. 
there, there's weekly communication from Intel that um, sends a different message. So it's not the same message over and over again. It's not just job alerts. There's something unique to the message there. And then testing for success. So really kind of evaluating the success of, of each um, campaign that you run, looking at the conversion metrics. Um, there's a concept called A-B testing that some people on the phone might know, but um, the idea there is that you send a control uh, version of an email and then maybe you tweak the subject line for a second option and you send both out at the same time, evaluate what was more successful, and then optimize from there. All right, so let's get into um, kind of what it actually looks like to build an email campaign. We're going to walk you through a couple videos. The one thing I do want to say is, and, and again, getting back to the question about you know, who manages this stuff and who really has time for it, um, this is where the user experience within the technology really does matter. Um, as you're evaluating the, the different technologies you could use, um, whether you're an enterprise brand that, that might use Smashfly or um, you're a smaller company, uh, maybe 100 employees with, with a one-person recruiting team, um, you know, there are tools out there for you as well. So it doesn't just have to be these huge enterprise systems. Uh, but really look at how easy the thing is going to be for you to use. If it's not going to be easy, I can promise you that your team's not going to adopt it and you're going to run into uh, issues. All right, so I'm going to play a couple videos here. You're probably not seeing it on the screen quite yet. I just want to set it up first. Um, kind of a fair warning, when we uploaded the videos to ReadyTalk, they got compressed really badly, and uh, they're not super easy for you to see what's going on. So I'm going to walk you through exactly kind of what you're seeing. But I'll preface it by saying this first email here, or this first video here, is going to be what it looks like uh, in Smashfly to actually build out an email campaign. And, and you'll kind of get a sense that, uh, of how easy it is. Within a couple minutes, you can, you can really build, build that out and choose your segments and, and get the campaign queued up and ready to go. So again, two minutes and you're done. But I'll walk you through it right now. So what you're seeing here is we're clicking on the tab to create a campaign. Um, we have the option to create a new campaign or add it to an existing campaign. Um, so let's say that you're just, you know, you're going to start from scratch. Um, you type in the campaign name. So in this case, it might be your monthly um, newsletter to your uh, military veteran um, talent network. Um, you type in the, the name of the email tactic and then just a description so you know and can, can kind of remember what, what you're doing. Here's where you'd uh, select your list. So we talked earlier about um, how, do you, how do you target previous applicants. Um, what we're doing here is just clicking on buttons that are adding people who are already in list to this campaign. So in this case, I chose marketing and sales and consulting. Um, and we have uh, those lists already in the CRM. So what it's doing here is adding those folks to this campaign. On the bottom here now, what we're doing is eliminating certain people. So we've got our marketing, sales, and consulting people in. Um, now, you know, sometimes it, it might make sense to, to take out a certain city. So let's say that you're from Boston and you don't want to recruit anybody from New York because, you know, Yankees, um, you might eliminate a city. Or you might um, target a specific school. So um, within your marketing and sales and consulting pipelines, maybe you want to target um, somebody with a, a degree from a certain university. You can do that as well. It's all really about filtering here. So getting as, as kind of focused and targeted as you can. Um, with the caveat, again, that you don't necessarily have to eliminate everybody. Um, you could keep this as broad as you want to, but the idea again is that um, you can really segment this list and target this list as much as you want. So, you know, again, if you're sending it to a marketing pipeline and you've got 5,000 people in, those mar in that marketing pipeline, um, but the job itself is in Boston, you can make sure that the email campaign only goes out to um, folks in Boston uh, first. And then if you have to widen your net after that, you can. So I'm sorry again for the video quality, but really what you're seeing here is, again, the, the ability there to, um, and, and qu how quickly really you can build out that campaign and build out your list of who it's going to. The next one here I think is probably the one that's going to show a little bit better, but the, the next question in your mind is, like, okay, that's great. It's easy enough to build a campaign. I don't have creative resources to build um, an actual template. So when I think about the, the actual email itself, you know, how do I build these beautiful branded um, email newsletters, right? This is where I think, um, again, having a, a tool and a technology with a great user experience is critical. So what I'll show you here is this is literally me in about a minute and 50 seconds building out a brand new email template. Um, you know, here we're going to add the logo. So whatever your logo is, 
I've already got it pre-uploaded, but we just threw a fake logo in there. Maybe you want to include a video. So you drag a video block over. Um, you can add a divider to add some spacing. Um, and then you go in to add um, kind of more elements. You can, you can drag in rows for, for where you want to add um, copy and, and kind of images before. So in this case, we're adding um, a row with three different blocks with three different elements. Um, you can really kind of do whatever you want here. Um, and just drag it right into place and kind of see how it looks. If you decide at some point that you don't want to include some elements, you can remove them. Um, but again, I think what we're trying to show here is just how easy this is. In this case here, what you're seeing is me adding the actual YouTube link. And as soon as you do that, the video is populated into the email. Um, you can add text, drag that right over. You've got a text block. Um, if you want to add, again, another divider to add some space, you can do that. And then once you want to edit the copy, um, you can just type in whatever you want. It shows up right away. Um, once, once you've kind of built this template out and you have everything in here that you want to include, you can also preview what it looks like on different um, devices and, and different mail clients. So whether you're sending to Gmail or Outlook, you have kind of the option to see what that looks like. So again, you know, I apologize for the blurriness, but what we're trying to show here is that in a matter of you know, two videos and really what was about four minutes total of time, um, you're able to build out an email campaign and then build out a, a brand new template and send that right to the, uh, the list that you built. All right, let's go to the last slide here. Oops, sorry about that. So Tracy, I know this is, this is kind of your summary here. I'll, I'll pass it over to you to, to kind of sum up the key takeaways from today's sessions, then we'll get to the uh, questions and answers. Sounds great. So I hope that we all understand how important uh, it is. And I know it's important to have a call to action, but omnichannel really is important when it comes to a standpoint from camp for campaigning. And I, I tell people this all the time, the chances are really solid that you already have the content that you need. So a lot of the people that I talk to are recruiters, and I think there's one in here like, who's responsible for doing this if you don't have a team? Um, quite frankly, you guys can email your talent, your pipelines, your interested parties, your silver medalists with the 100 questions that they all ask you every time that you talk to a candidate. Um, so that's content that already exists that's in your brain. And then if you start getting that out, you're going to be asked a different set of questions that will generate more content. So you already have a lot of this to take care uh, to use. And it doesn't have to be really hard to build these campaigns, but you have to have the right technology to do it. And that's that. So. Do you guys want to open it up to questions, Josh, Elise? Sure. Do you want to just quickly brief everyone on the call about Transform coming back before we get to Q&A? Yes. Um, yeah. Especially for people yeah, for that sure. are looking kind of for recruitment marketing best practices and product adoption. I'll let you guys just give 30 seconds on that, and we'll jump to Q&A. Josh, 30 go seconds for it. Probably isn't yeah, 30 seconds probably isn't enough, but we'll be quick. So. Uh, for anybody who's not aware of what Transform is, this is our event that we created. Uh, we had a live event in 2016. The last two years it's been virtual. We're actually bringing the live experience back. It's going to be June 19th to the 21st in Boston. It is not a user conference. Um, that's not to say that it's not valuable for users, but it is very much focused on best practices and really advancing the industry for So it's purely um, education about recruitment marketing um, and, and really trying to design a, a agenda with Beard over two days that um, when you walk back to your day job, you'll have a lot of actionable things to take back. Um, again, not this big smash life. So if you never become a smash life customer, that's totally okay. Um, Transform is still kind of a great conference for you if, you, if you're just looking to learn and, and really advance your skills. Uh, so we have a, a waitlist open right now. Um, if you join the waitlist, we're offering 10% off of the early bird rate of 995 which again, I think is actually a really good deal when you look at how much these conferences can cost um, and what you're really going to get from this. Um, but just sign up for the waitlist. Um, you'll get that discount no matter what. There's no commitment if you join the waitlist. Um, it's just you basically raising your hand and saying you're interested. Uh, we'll share the link out to that waitlist um, with everybody that that was uh, that had signed up for the webinar after this. Awesome. Yes, I'll be sharing that right now in the the chat link. But let's we have five minutes left. Thanks for everyone who's still on. We've had a ton of really great questions coming through the chat. Um, so let's take a look. Um, so actually, this is probably something, uh, Josh, I know you dealt with this from Smashfly, but someone had a question about email campaigns and GDPR. 
So how is GDPR coming into play for some of these, especially if you have European Canada to find? Great question. So um, the beauty of um, – this is where I'm going to kind of lean on – again, I don't want to – I mean, it's not a pitch for Smashfly, but the beauty of a platform like Smashfly, and there are other technologies that offer this as well, is people will not be allowed to opt in. Uh, or I, let me put it this way. When people opt in, um, we're asking for their permission, and we're, we're very clearly outlining um, how we'll be communicating with them um, in a way that's compliant with GDPR. So at the very first um, kind of handshake and, and the point at which somebody says, I'm interested in, in kind of hearing from you, that's when we, we secure permission and we make sure that, that you're protected uh, from GDPR. If at any point somebody decides they don't want to hear from you anymore, they want to change their, the communications they get from you, we also give them options for that. And a lot of, time that's, a lot of times that's baked into the email itself. So as you know, it's best practice and is standard because of can spam, um, anybody can opt out or kind of unsubscribe at any point. Um, we also allow uh, candidates through our customers to uh, change their communication preferences or understand at any time how they're being communicated with. So there's a, there are multiple layers of protections in place here so that when you're sending out an email campaign, um, you're sure that you have permission to do it and you're compliant. You can also, when you're building out your list and building out your campaign, make sure that um, it's not sent to anybody who hasn't opted in. So again, you'll never send to somebody who um, never gave you permission. Great. Thanks, Josh. Tracy, this is a good one for you because I know that at Smashfly you've dealt with a small budget in terms of recruitment marketing as for a pretty small <laughs> company. But um, do you have any examples of successful campaigns for smaller companies that don't have a big budget or just kind of where do you start um, if you're looking to kind of expand and pull your brand, expand recruitment marketing, and you're not dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars like a marketing team? Yes. So um, uh, the, I was also I am also the employer brand uh, lead here at Smashfly in my center of excellence. Um, I did make air quotes in case you guys weren't looking at me. Uh, <laughs> I'm not on camera. Anyway, um, we don't have a budget, and what we tip we, what we actually did was we leveraged our employees, and we didn't do it in a typical recruitment uh, referral program way. What we did was we sent basically everybody that works at Smashfly our employer branded content, and we asked them to post. Uh, these these pieces of content that talked about our culture, that talked about employee stories, that had uh, the the uh, some great tips for candidates, that talked about technology and human capital management, things that we're really passionate about at Smashfly, and we asked everybody at our company to say, hey, put this on your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, and make sure that you have this tracking link in it, and we we did that. Uh, for and we continued, you know, we do that over a period of time, and it was our actually our number one. Um, our number one source of applicant uh, for the period of time that we were doing this. And you can do that without a tool. You could literally just use your email, say copy and paste this into your LinkedIn, and off you go. Um, we do have that tracking technology in Smashfly, so we did get to use our own, um, our own software for that. But there was no budget to do this. Um, I, there's, a, there's another employer brand out there called Buffer. Uh, they're a social scheduling tool. Um, I'm guessing based on buffer size that they don't have a ginormous budget. But what they do is that they, they just basically send you communications. They do a great job on social. They just promote it because it's part of their it's part of what they need to accomplish. And they're not they I don't think they have a big budget. I know I didn't have a big budget at Smashfly. So how you start is you get your own people involved. You know what the best way to start? You guys are gonna use that this magic word in our space called a pilot. You're going to do a pilot program. You're going to select a little team within your company to do this quote-unquote pilot, and then everybody at the end of this is going to have the most sincere case of FOMO that they've ever had because the team that did the pilot is going to have major success, and then everybody's going to want to do a little bit of it, which is what we did here at Smash Life. <laughs> I love that. FOMO Seriously, is a strategy. Bring a pilot. Exactly. Bring pilot into, into your lingo. It, it works with marketing, too, and, and pitching some ideas to see how it goes. Okay, I think we have a minute for one more question. Someone asked, um, you know, for small companies who don't have in-house recruitment marketing teams, how do you get buy-in to do this stuff? And I just want to caveat this. We work with a lot of big companies at Smashfly who don't have recruitment marketing teams either and who struggle to get buy-in. So you're not alone. <laughs> you, you small companies out there, buy-in is a hard thing to get. Change is a hard thing to do. But Jay-Z or Tracy, either one of you could probably take this. 
what's your number one to kind of get buy-in to start campaigning, start marketing, get a technology like this? Um, usually people buy things when there's a return on things. So I can, going back to that story before, if you do a quick pilot, so, you know, Sarah, I'm guessing that you might be, you might be a recruiter. And if you start to implement some of these recruitment marketing techniques and you get better results than your peers, then you can take those results to your boss and say, hey, I did these three things differently, and this was the result we got. We shortened our time to fill. We shortened our time to find. We lowered our cost per hire because we were doing these things, and guess what? Then suddenly there's going to be money that's freed up for that. That's how I've seen it typically done. Yeah, and I would agree, Tracy. I, I think it would start for me at least at looking at the traditional tactics you use to attract talent. So, um, you know, for a lot of companies, that's that's job boards, um, or it's kind of paid advertising or, or paid resources. It could be working with a staffing firm. Or but a I would look recruit at, I would look or at the, a staffing yeah. firm, exactly. Right, yeah. So I would look at those sources and, and really kind of dig into the efficiency of them. Um, because even if, you don't, even if you don't pilot something and you don't have the time to really test something out, you can look at kind of other companies that marks and say, like, you know, for example, GE had 25% uh, um, open rate, I think, in a whatever is ten percent click through rate, two and a half percent apply. You can you can benchmark that against those other sources and say to your leadership, look, give me give me a little bit of money, just give me something to test this. Um, give me a month, let me run a couple campaigns, and let's see how this works. And if it works, then you have you have a very clear, um, you know, case uh, business case for for doing it at a bigger scale. But just start small. Um, don't to Tracy's point earlier, don't feel like you got to boil the ocean and, and tackle everything at once. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. I know we're two minutes over. This was the finale webinar of 2018. We're so excited you guys joined us, and I think uh, Josh and Tracy crushed it. So please look out for an email with slides and recording. You'll also probably see a little call to action about the Transform waitlist, and hopefully we got to a lot of your questions. Um, you guys have a great rest of the year. We'll see you in 2019. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.